lights of hope in a week of surging cases. It's one of the hardest things I've ever done. Positive messages. Positivity is infectious. That we will all get through this together. You are not alone. And this has never been more true of right now. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Ockeblum. And I'm Vanessa Welch. We will get through this together, and we're looking for lights of hope right now in a really tough stretch of this outbreak. We have some inspiring stories in the next 30 minutes, plus helpful advice on issues you may be dealing with, from anxiety to relationship stress. We begin with 25 Investigates' Carrie Cavanaugh now with our continuing coverage of real people impacted by the soaring unemployment crisis. Hi, uh, I'm Steve Sprague, and I'm from Milford, Massachusetts. I'm Adriana D'Amelio. I'm from Revere. I'm Hector from East Boston. Hi, my name is Sue Bruno. I'm from Marrows, Massachusetts. My name is Megan Lawrence. I'm from Ashley Falls, Massachusetts. As cities and towns across Massachusetts sit still, residents facing sudden unemployment are struggling to get help. We asked Boston 25 News viewers to explain it in their own words. I get the following error message when I try to reset my password. Um, it says your account does not meet requirements for password reset. I've been trying for two weeks to reach a live person to change a forgotten password. Uh, I've been trying to apply online for unemployment benefits since March 20th. It's been a disaster. We have heard the same website complaints since the COVID-19 crisis began. I didn't ask for the this pandemic. I just want to know why I can't speak to a real live human being at the Mass Unemployment Office. This is very stressful and I just really need a call back. The State Office of Unemployment Assistance says it's ramped up a 50 person staff to more than 600 who are fielding calls. Since March 23rd, they've made over 60,000 callbacks to constituents and are now making over 6,000 calls a day, according to state data. And the UA tells 25 Investigates it just installed a password fix to the site Tuesday night. In addition, they say Massachusetts' site has never crashed during the crisis. And tens of thousands of people have been able to file, and the numbers are unprecedented. The week of March 15th, more than 148,000 people filed for unemployment. The week of March 22nd, more than 180,000. This past week, claims approached 140,000. But April brought about a new complaint. For some, the money isn't coming in. I've been waiting for my unemployment for about three weeks now. The payment is saying it's on hold and I cannot get through to anybody. Something has to be done. And those who are self-employed finally on Thursday got some information from the state, which says it's working to build a new platform on the site for them to apply for new federal benefits. I'm facing financial insecurities that are mounting daily. It's like having an ocean full of life rafts three feet away constantly. We need some help. People are drowning. The Office of Unemployment Assistance says other states' websites have crashed, forcing those states to revert to paper applications. They say Massachusetts was the first state in the country to move its unemployment website to the cloud. For 25 Investigates, I'm Carrie Cavanaugh. There are so many people um, who need help across the Commonwealth, and we're going to try to make sure that no matter where you live in the Commonwealth, if you are in need, we will find a way to get resources to you. That was Massachusetts Governor, I uh, should say First Lady Lauren Baker, talking about what they have as the COVID-19 Relief Fund, which has already raised some $13 million. Mrs. Baker tells us Massachusetts has a tradition of stepping up in a time of tragedy. To learn more about the fund or to make a donation, we have posted a link on boston25news.com. That fund will also help frontline health care workers. I spoke with an ICU doctor about what it's like for them right now. She and her husband made the very difficult decision to send their kids to live with their grandparents out of state so they could commit themselves to this fight. The world is just a little bit on end right now. Critical um. care doctor Brittany Bankhead Kendall's world is the intensive care unit at Mass General right now. I know it's crazy busy. Describe for us what you guys are seeing, what you're going through right now. Just the sheer fact of coming into work every day and being a little bit scared and knowing that you are literally putting your life on the line to do the job that you do every day is 
pushing everyone to the limit. Um, a lot of my colleagues um, are sleeping in the basement for months on end so that they're not interacting with their family or moving out or sending their own families away. Brittany's husband is an emergency medicine doctor, so they made the difficult decision to send their kids to live with her parents in Texas. Just so that we could fully focus on our patients here and volunteering for extra shifts and doing lots of research. But it's hard and you miss them. So much, <laughs> so much. Yeah, um, it's one of the hardest things I've ever done. But every night before bed, we try to have our son read to us on FaceTime like we're there. And he said, Mom, my heart is in a million pieces, but I know that you're taking care of people, and I know that people are gonna get better, so it's okay right now, Mom. You can be with your patients <laughs> at the same time. And realized how crazy the world is right now, but just as a mom, you do what you have to, and you make it work. Do you know when you'll see your kids again? I mean, I imagine that's the hardest part of this, is that we don't know when this yeah. is gonna end and when you're gonna be reunited. We're still in the thick of it, so for now, it's just a waiting game and lots of songs. <laughs> On FaceTime. You're making these huge sacrifices, you and your husband, but you guys wouldn't have it any other way. I'm scared, to be honest, but I also trained my whole life for this. I'm really excited about the opportunity to be here um, and to be on the front lines and to do this. The outbreak and the isolation is taking a toll on the mental health of many. This is a tremendous test of human resilience. We'll talk with the medical director for NAMI for ideas on caring for our emotional well-being in these challenging days. And we're going inside a bustling warehouse, but this one isn't for Amazon. How the region's largest food bank is handling an unprecedented demand for help. The U.S. Surgeon General warned last weekend that this could be, quote, the hardest and the saddest week in most Americans' lives. Spoke with Dr. Ken Duckworth, the medical director for the National Alliance on Mental Illness, or NAMI, and he had some encouraging points for those who are struggling. So the Surgeon General says that this is our Pearl Harbor moment. Uh, that metaphor does imply both anxiety and fear, but also lack of preparation, but it did end with us figuring it out. And so I think that metaphor, while maybe not perfect uh, and maybe anxiety provoking, does portend a good long-term process or outcome. Right now, we're profoundly connected and acting in a collective manner. And I think we're gonna you know, get, see our way through this, although the world may be changed in some fundamental ways. What about people who have been dealing now for a few weeks? with the uncertainty, with the fear, and how can those people be helped right now? One of the things that's remarkable is that we have transformed mental health care into a telehealth service as, switch, as fast uh, as anything I've ever seen. What are you hearing from the other doctors in the field? The telehealth is working for people. The patients like it better than they thought, and the therapists and psychiatrists are surprised that it works. Uh, it's very interesting. This is like a little side road that we had that everyone ignored, and now it's the only highway that's being used. And I've already had questions. After the emergency, can we go back to just doing telehealth? I think my patients don't wanna fight for parking and drive to my office. They show up 100% of the time and on time. In fact, I can see more patients in a day. In what other ways can we help those in our circle? There's no question that we're all adjusting to the loss of social connections. Humans are intensely social. And uh, the idea that you can't hang out uh, with your people is a challenge. Because of technology, I've actually been able to connect with people in my life, you know, my nieces, my nephews, people I might have called on occasion. Now we're kind of FaceTiming on the regular, and it's fun uh, to connect in that way. When I last spoke to you, you had talked about the NAMI walk this year perhaps being a virtual walk. Well, that has now come to pass. That's the way it will be. And tell us why that walk in particular is so important to people. Is it's the major fundraiser for the state affiliate, which is NAMI, Massachusetts. So this year, I think the pivot is to figure out how to make an, a virtual walk successful for people. Given all we've gone through and we'll go through in the coming days and weeks, it helps end the stigma of mental illness because so many people realize 
At some form or another, or some time or another, we all need help. One of NAMI's slogans is, you are not alone. And this has never been more true of right now. I feel like because this is a national experience, I think many people with psychiatric vulnerabilities would say they feel less alone, even as they may face greater challenges. Dr. Ken Duckworth, we appreciate your time as always. Be well. Pleasure to see you. Thank you for all you're doing to cover this story and take care. There are lots of resources available on the NAMI website. If you or someone you know is struggling right now and needs help, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at the number on your screen, 1-800-273-TALK. The Greater Boston Food Bank supplies vital necessities to Eastern Massachusetts, and their shipments have recently doubled. Boston 25 News anchor Jean Levanche gives us a closer look at how they're meeting this unprecedented demand. We open at 4 in the morning and we close when we're done. Today we are bringing in 13 trucks of items, orange juice, cereal, potatoes, produce, raisins, canned chicken and cereal. A complicated ballet of movers gets tons of food into this 117,000 square foot facility. I'm going to Sudbury, Bellingham. And then ships it out to more than 500 food pantries and soup kitchens across eastern Massachusetts. Yep, we Rainham, need to provide healthy meals to those in need. We're in the food business. Figuring out all of the logistics is... Mangoes, yogurt. There she goes. Cheryl Shondek, Senior Vice President of Food Acquisition and Supply Chain for the Greater Boston Food Bank. It hasn't been easy. Our volume has doubled. If we look at what we distributed in March, it is over 8 million pounds of healthy food. Our volume continues to grow. Wide-scale layoffs have sent many people to food banks for the first time. Given the unemployment figures that we see every day, the face of hunger continues to change and the need continues to increase. Today, Shondek is grateful to her suppliers, but is concerned about the future. We have not yet determined what our max point is. So as I mentioned, the volume has doubled. In my opinion, we are, we will be there soon. For now, the staff is working six days a week and doing everything they can to make sure people have enough to eat. Shondek says they're used to handling emergencies and economic downturns, but believes this one is different. I think it's the fear of the unknown. We don't have a playbook. We are creating a playbook every day. In my 30 years in the food business, we've had to handle weather disasters. We have never had to handle a disaster such as this. Fresh Express salad mix. But for her, food remains a comfort, especially when she can get it to someone who needs it. I'll open up this box. Got some beautiful vine ripe tomatoes for our client. If you have a question about how to find a pantry in your community, you'll find a link at boston25news.com. You can also call 211. And if you're interested in helping out the Greater Boston Food Bank, we have included a link for that as well. In the newsroom, Gene Levanchi, Boston 25 News. Tensions bubbling over at home, even in the strongest of relationships. We'll sit down with a marriage coach for advice on handling all of this time together. Tonight's the first night of Passover, and Easter is this coming Sunday. This is the first time that we'll ever have technology at our Passover Seder. The creative approaches people are taking to practice their religious traditions while also practicing social distancing. In times of crisis, people often look for leaders to guide us through, and we've seen that every day with updates from our city, state, and federal officials. Sure have, but there are a lot of leaders in small businesses, neighborhoods, and even in families right now that are having an impact. We spoke with a Babson management professor about what it takes to be a light in dark times. We're always looking to be collectively together around some common cause, and I think when when crisis happens and that kind of social fabric is ruptured, people are then looking for a leader. Babson professor Nan Langowitz spoke to CEOs after the recession to find out what leadership qualities help them make it to the other side. Five traits stuck out. Communication, focus, patience, positivity, and imagination. 
It's amazing that the creativity and the initiative that's that's been happening. Langwood says those same skills can be applied to your world right now. All the people who are mobilizing to collect PPE or to make masks, that's just innate leadership coming out in people who say, hey, there's something that needs to get done. I'm going to do it. So you want to look for something that uh, really speaks to you. And then think about how could I reach out to someone else to, to brainstorm? How could we tackle this particular issue, whatever it is? And I think that's the way we usually see leadership happens. And you can do that over social media uh, just as much as you could do it face to face. And she cautions not to get stuck in crisis mode. Even leaders need to make time for self-care, a good book, or a walk in fresh air. That's what people need to do in order to recharge their energy and be able to face the next day with positivity. Free your mind and the rest will follow, mm -hmm. right? It's not always easy, though, staying positive when snippy comments and slammed doors are happening at home. Quarantine puts pressure on any relationship. I sat down with a licensed counselor for some advice on how to keep the peace. It's unnatural for all of us to spend this much time together. So naturally, being in a close space where we don't have the freedom to go out and do other things, we're going to be on each other's nerves. We're going to be irritated with each other. Marriage and relationship coach Denise Fitzpatrick says couples need to get on the same page to avoid overwhelming tension at home. A pain point for some families disagreeing about how they should be social distancing. One person might think it's OK to go to the grocery store and I don't have to worry about that. The other person might be like, no, we have to do home delivery and then we have to wipe everything down with Lysol. So there's really this discrepancy between um, partners about what's safe and what's not. Fitzpatrick says it's best to be kind to a partner who's dealing with anxiety. More than ever, it's so important that couples really get on the same team, even if they haven't been before. Teamwork is going to be more important than ever. So understanding we're both in this together. When it comes to balancing working from home and possibly remote learning too, identify when things will be especially busy and come up with a schedule, planning who will be responsible for different blocks of time. So it's planning in advance, talking when things are calm, because when you're in the moment, we all sort of lose our rational brain and we, we're not thinking logically and things can explode. Even for really strong relationships, this situation being together all the time, it's going to take a toll on them. The minute you think it shouldn't be this way, then that's what's going to cause you suffering. If you just sort of give into it and know that it's going to be hard, it's going to be hard for everybody. Embrace the hard. Embrace it, yeah. Fitzpatrick recommends carving out some time for self-care, even if it's just a walk, and recognize when the situation is more than you can handle alone. So if you were struggling before this, and now you know that and things have been magnified, then reach out. This is the time. Still ahead on this in-depth special, marking holy days during a pandemic. The creative approaches some are taking to practice religious traditions while social distancing. With Easter and Passover this week, many local families are finding new ways to celebrate together. Boston 25 News reporter Michael Henrik shows us how they're using technology to stay connected. Every year at a Seder, the meal and at-home service celebrating the Jewish holiday Passover, the youngest child asks, why is this night different than all other nights? At this year's celebrations, the differences will be clear. This is the first time that we'll ever have technology at our Passover Seder. Michelle Lanner originally planned on hosting family from California, Florida, and Canada at her home in Hull. It's all about the family bonding. It's all about we sit around, everybody reads the Haggadah, we sing. Um, it is probably the true meaning of family for, for us. Instead, she and her 17 relatives will practice social distancing and practice their religious traditions together through Zoom. They'll have their own Seder plates because we virtually can't feed each other. Been hearing from different parishioners, they miss their parish. Father Matt Williams of St. John the Baptist and St. Joseph's in Quincy says Holy Week for Catholics will also look different this year. The churches are open, but adhering to a maximum 10 person gathering. Confessions are being heard in a drive through. The priest has, we have balloons on our car, we have somebody directing traffic and people drive up six feet apart. And the normally packed pews during mass will once again be replaced by clicks on live streams.
people of different faiths finding new ways to connect during the holidays. Thank God for the gift of modern technology that we can do this. Unfortunately for the people in California, they do have to start a lot earlier. <laughs> That is an early brisket for the Californians. Another church in the area, a Baptist church, is holding Easter services like a drive-in movie, asking parishioners to come in their cars and turn the pastor's voice on the radio. All different creative approaches to staying connected during a week that's so special to so many. I'm Michael Henrik reporting Boston 25 News. We hope the last 30 minutes have been helpful for you. And remember, we have a ton of resources on the coronavirus outbreak on our website, app, and on social media. Thanks for joining us for this in-depth special, Finding Lights of Hope as we make our way through the coronavirus outbreak. From all of us here at Boston 25 News, be well and have a great night.